Archer Hill Church, we invite you to stand and sing with us this morning.
Hey, Orchard Hill Church, my name is Topher and I am on staff here at Orchard in Kids Ministry. And I am here to let you know that we are only two weeks out from Vacation Bible School 2022. The Orchard Kids team has been hard at work getting stuff ready, painting, cutting, getting all kinds of crafts and games and worship experiences ready for kids to come and learn about God's monumental love for them, along with exploring some of the amazing vistas of the American Southwest. Right now, registration is open. So if you have not gotten your kids signed up for VBS, please go to our website, sign them up, and we will get them into a crew and ready for an incredible week experiencing God's love and faithfulness in their lives. We are also looking for a bunch of fantastic volunteers. Orchard Hill Church, this is one of the biggest things that happens inside of our walls all year long. And it can't happen without incredible people like you jumping in and loving the kids and families of Orchard Hill Church. So if you're available June 5th through the 9th, we would love to invite you to join our team jump in as a greeter or a name tag maker or a crew leader. I promise it's not as scary as it sounds. This is going to be an incredible week and we have been praying and looking forward to it all year long. So please grab a friend, let a family in your neighborhood or school know about it and sign up to join us at VBS 2022. Two weeks away, summer is almost here. Two weeks away, VBS will be happening right here in this room and across the building. Um, we would love to have you guys serve with us. It's going to be monumental. See what I did there? You like that, Bradley? Yes, that's the theme. That's the theme. Okay, uh, something that just occurred to me while watching that video is here at Orchard, we have four core strategies that we believe help you take steps in your faith to engage in the Bible, to worship God together, to belong in community, and invest in others. And VBS, you get to do all four of those all at the same time, four nights in a row right here in this room. So I just encourage you guys, get signed up for your kids and also sign up to volunteer because we can't make that happen without you guys. Hey, once again, welcome to Orchard Hill Church. My name is Tim Walston. I'm on staff here. Thank you for joining us in person, but also online for you guys at home. We are excited to have you. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite our hospitality team to start receiving the offering. There are a lot of different ways that you can give here at Orchard Hill Church. One of the easiest is through our online app called PushPay, which if you just scan that QR code that's in front of you, that will take you to a page to uh, set up that giving. And also, for those of you at home, you can also text CENTRAL to 319-553-6690, and you'll get that same information among, uh, along with a bunch of other stuff about who we are here at Orchard if you are investigating that. Thank you guys so much for your continued giving here at Orchard. Um, everything that you see happening in this room and in this building today, but also week in and week out, even just keeping the lights on and switching the furnaces to the AC, um, that happens in part to you guys faithfully and gener generosity um, giving week in and week out. So we thank you for that. Um, we got just a, a couple things here. We are always inviting people to take next steps in their faith. And so we've been highlighting a couple of those opportunities the last few weeks. So just real quick, kind of as a reminder for those that have been here a few weeks, we have um, small groups that are going to be launching in the fall. But right now in the spring, we're actually looking for hosts and getting them trained up. So if you're interested in doing that, be sure to scan that QR code to get signed up. And then the other thing is we're in the middle of our two, 2022 Let's Keep Going Fund Drive to a, a fix some things around here in the CF campus as well as our other two campuses. And so again, just one next step is faithfully giving and, and being a part of this mission. Um, and we invite you guys to do that. Hey, this morning, we are in week two of our transformational series, and Pastor Ed is here. I'm excited. He has a great message about Jacob. We're going to learn all kinds of things, and I'm just excited for that. But before we dive into that, um, we're also going to sing some songs. But even before that, this is a special day because we know that there are a lot of high school students that are graduating. High school graduation is happening today. I know for Cedar Falls, some of the Waterloo schools, I know some of the other area schools maybe have already even had those or 
they're happening. Um, so we want to acknowledge those graduates and also pray for them. But not only the high school seniors, how about college graduates? We know some of those graduations have also been happening um, during this month of May. And so we just want to pause, acknowledge, and then pray for them before uh, they go off into their next journey of life. All right? So I invite you guys to, uh, to pray with me right now. Dear God, we pray for our graduates this morning. We pray for peace, wisdom, for protection, and for blessing and favor. We pray for courage, hope, and a purpose for these students. We pray for their hearts to walk closely with you. God, we pray that you give these graduates wisdom and direction in making decisions and in each new situation and journey you have for them now. Teach them to listen closely to your voice, that they would have a heart to obey your word and have a desire for right choices. We pray that these we love so much would walk faithfully and diligently in all your ways. And we ask that you make their footsteps firm, that your word would be a constant lamp for their feet and a light to their path. May they sense the freshness of your spirit, God, in their lives in amazing ways. And may they be strengthened and instilled with hope for the new roads that you have in store. God, we ask for your wisdom and clear direction over their lives, that you would give them an understanding beyond their years. We ask for you to open doors that need to be opened and close every one of them that should be shut tight. Allow every gift and treasure you have placed in their lives to grow and flourish, to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, we're going to sing some songs together. And so I invite you all, let's stand and prepare to sing together some songs. Go ahead and stand up. Here's a scripture, Psalm 65, 8. Psalm 65, 8. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You call forth songs of joy. The whole earth is filled with your awe and wonders. I have a four-year-old, his name's Anderson. And when he was two, after a emergency room visit, uh, we found out he was diagnosed with one of those nut allergies. And I was like, all right, Shell, my wife, like we're one of those families that just is what it is. No nuts in the house, can't be around them, all that stuff. Well, the doctors encouraged us. They said, hey, in a couple years, come back and we'll do some checks because sometimes kids can grow out of allergies. Just like as we get older, <laughs> we might grow into allergies. Um, so sure enough, just back in March, the end of March, we took uh, Anderson down to Iowa City, the Children's Hospital. He got tested, all the skin stuff and the blood. Praise the Lord, allergy free. Isn't that amazing? God works in mysterious ways. So it was right before Easter. So what was the first peanut butter treat we had him try? <laughs> you know, the perfect combination, the ratio of peanut butter and chocolate, the Reese's Easter egg bunny. He bit into that. <laughs> the look on his face filled with awe and wonder as he experienced a great gift from God. He ate almost all of it. And then he looked to mom. He goes, mom, mom, you got to try this. It's so good. I just thought that was so awesome. Guys, as I get older and older, I feel like there's not too many things in this world that amaze me much anymore. I'm like, yeah, seen that, done that. But maybe I just need to change the lens, change the perspective to be seeking God's awe and wonder in and amongst our lives every day. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. How can I acknowledge and give glory to Father, Son, and Spirit? Give him all the praise because every breath is a gift. Every moment is a treasure. As we fix our eyes on Jesus, May we see the awe and wonder and the great gifts of who God is and what he's done for us and respond with praise. Let's do that now. I 
fix my eyes upon you. I fix my eyes upon you. to meet us Father, Son, and Spirit All praise All praise God and man together One with us forevermore In famine we will eat In drought Should my heart grow weary? Don't be so downcast, oh my soul. You are in every moment. You are my greatest miracle. Why should my heart grow weary? Don't be so downcast, oh my soul. You are in every moment. You are my greatest miracle. Why should my heart grow weary? sing this out together, the perfect Son of God. Oh, the perfect Son of God, in all His innocence, He'll walk in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is, He's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering, oh blood and tears, how can it be? 
There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. And hallelujah to the son of suffering. We sing hallelujah. Our distant and removed, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. Thank you, Father. To the sin you were graced, and the broken you embraced. And in the end, the proof is in the ghost. Yes, sing that again. In the end. Yes, in the end. set us free. Let's sing this together. Your cross. Your cross is my freedom. Your stripes are my healing. All praise King Jesus. Glory to God in heaven. Your blood is still speaking. Your love is still reaching. All praise King Jesus. Glory to God forever. Your cross is my freedom. Your stripes are my healing. All praise, King Jesus. Glory to God. Come on, lift your voices. Your blood. Your blood is still speaking. Your love is still reaching. All praise, King Jesus. Glory to God. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is 
thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness great Father, this morning we are so grateful for your faithfulness. In this world, we experience the awe and wonder of everything you've created, of every good gift that comes from you. And God, we also experience brokenness. We experience suffering. And we're so grateful that you don't leave us alone in any of those things. God, your presence is constant. Your love is forever. Your power is real. Father, help us to trust you. Help us to seek you in times of trouble. And God, this morning, would you open our hearts, God, that we we could take a step closer to you. In Jesus' name, everybody said together, amen. Y'all, thanks for singing. You can take a seat. Thank you, Bradley. Let me add my congratulations to graduates. Uh, We're proud of you and happy for you. Every year at graduation time, I remember a year when when I was pastor here, we used to get invited to a lot of graduation open houses. And one one year, there were 17 of them. And my son, Dan, who was in like second grade at that point, decided he was going to eat a piece of cake at every open house. You've never seen anyone enjoy cake less than he did by the time we got to 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. But his intentions were were good. One of the the things that I believe really strongly is that when we encounter God, when we meet God, it changes us. And that feels to me like that was sort of the essence of what we were hearing about in our recent series, Stories from the Seats. People like us just talking about how they encountered God, met God in unusual and usual ways and how it changed them. So now we're kind of looking at the Bible and saying, you know, that's sort of the same thing that we find in the Bible as well. In fact, that's not, I think that's not a bad way to read the Bible, to be looking at those instances where people met God and it changed them. And we're going to be looking at one of those guys today, Jacob, in the Old Testament. And I have the feeling that to get into it, maybe we need a little uh, Old Testament history lesson. So I want you to just lean back, relax, and get ready for this, because I'm going to lay some stuff on you here. So we actually have to go back to the time of Abraham. So there are two dates in the Old Testament that I, that I push a lot that I think are really helpful to remember. One is Abraham lived 2,000 B.C., 2,000 years before Jesus, and King David lived 1,000 years before Jesus. So those are good dates, easy to remember, to kind of hang Old Testament history on. So Abraham lives when? That was a test, by the way. Yep. 2,000 B.C., and David is? 1000 BC. We're going back to Abraham, and really it's in Abraham that God begins this creative, redemptive process that culminates in Jesus Christ. So Abraham and his family live in Ur of the Chaldees, and at at some point they leave that, they move to the city of Haran, and there it is that God calls Abraham. And he tells Abraham to leave everything there, his culture, all that he's known, and to set out and to, to go to a place that God will lead him to. And, and God takes him then to Canaan, which would be like Israel today. And there God makes a couple promises to Abraham. One is, he says, I'm going to make of your descendants a, a great nation. That's where it talks about, like, your descendants are going to be like the sand of the seashore or the stars in the sky. And he says, through your descendants, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So... It's through Jesus that that, is going to, that promise is going to be ultimately fulfilled as a descendant of Abraham. There is a problem with all of this, however, and that is that Abraham and his wife Sarah have no children, and they're getting to be very old. Abraham is 100, Sarah is 90, and miraculously, 
they conceive and give birth to a son who is Isaac. Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, have two sons. They are twin boys, Esau and Jacob. It's Jacob we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, But let me give you a little history about both of them. Those three people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are referred to in the Bible as being the patriarchs. They're sort of the founders of not only the Jewish faith, but our faith as Christians as well. We look back to the time of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, Jacob and Esau were twins, but they were very different. Esau was the older brother. He was born first. Um, Not much difference between them, apparently, because it says that Jacob was holding on to to Esau's heel when Esau was born. But Esau is older. And in that culture, the oldest son had all the advantages. It's the older son who would inherit the, the bulk of his family's wealth. And make no mistake about it, Isaac, Abraham and Isaac, were very wealthy men. It talks about their their herds, their cattle, their sheep, the goats, the camels. They were wealthy, wealthy men. They had many servants. In fact, there's a story about Abraham where Abraham kind of needs to get together a rescue party to rescue his his nephew Lot. And it says he, he pulled together over 300 of his male servants. So these were wealthy, wealthy guys. Esau, as the older son, is going to inherit the bulk of that. He's going to be a very rich man. Now, Esau was loved by his father, Isaac. Esau was, he was a man's man. It says he was big and strong and hairy. He loved to hunt. You know, a lot of testosterone flowing in that boy, and his father loved him. Jacob was a mama's boy says that he liked to stay back in the tents. Remember, these were nomads. They didn't have houses. They lived in tents. And I think for most of my life, I, I didn't picture that very well. I was picturing sort of the Boy Scout, you know, pup tent kind of thing. But when we were in Israel, we actually saw some tents that nomads are living in today. They are huge, you know, a thousand square feet in these big, big tents. So those were the tents, the kind of tents that they lived in. Jacob stayed back with his mother, and she coddled him, and he was a mama's boy. Two other things you need to know about these twins. First is that Esau was a fool, and Jacob was a liar and a cheat. And in the first incident we see about Jacob and Esau interacting together, we see both of these things being portrayed very well. So we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture dealing with that. In what book of the Bible will we find stories about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau? Genesis. That's right. We had to go all the way back to Genesis. We're going to be looking at Genesis starting in chapter 25. And so this is a time when, when Esau has gone out hunting. He's come back and he interacts with his younger brother, Jacob, his younger twin brother. So this is starting with verse 29. It says, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. And he said to Jacob, quick, oh, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. And Jacob replied, first, some of your birthright. Oh, look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, the birthright meant that by birth, being the older son, he had the right to all of this wealth that his family had accumulated, and he cares nothing about it. What a, I said he was a fool. I mean, he comes back in, oh, I'm starving. I got to have some, something to eat. Well, he's there at the tents. He could fix himself a sandwich. It's not like he's really dying, but he wants some of this stew that his brother fixed. He cares so little about the birthright, he's willing to trade it for a, for a pot of stew. Esau was a fool. And Jacob takes advantage of that. And so now Jacob is the one who will inherit all of these riches from his brother. 
The next time we encounter these brothers is several years later. Isaac, their father, is an old man. He's dying. He's bedfast. He's mostly blind. And he realizes that before he dies, he needs to pass on the blessing to his elder son Esau. The blessing meant that Esau would become the leader of the family, the leader of the clan. It was the, the, the right of prestige and leadership that he needed to pass on to his, to his brother. So he is to his son, excuse me. So this is in Genesis chapter 27. Isaac calls Esau into him, and this is what he says to him. Isaac said, I am an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Who does that sound like? Sure sounds like his son, doesn't he? Son's a lot like his father. Oh, I'll pass on the blessing, but first just give me some of this really good food that you make that I enjoy so much. So Esau says, okay. So he heads out and he goes hunting to get some wild game that he can prepare for his dad. Rebecca hears this, and she calls Jacob into him and says, this is, this is our chance now. You've got the birthright. Now you can get the blessing. All we have to do is fool your father. So she tells Jacob to go and get a lamb from the flock and bring it in. She says, I'll make the food for him just the way I know, I know your dad likes it. You've got to pretend to be Esau. So to do that, they take some lamb's wool and they tie it, fasten it on the back of his hands and on his neck. And they give him some of Esau's clothing to wear so that he'll smell like Esau. You can make of that what you want. But so, so they get the stew ready. And so Jacob goes into his father and he says, well, <clears throat> here I am, dad, with the food for you so you can give me the blessing. And Isaac is a little suspicious. It doesn't sound like Esau. So he says, you know, come here. And so Jacob walks over to his bedside, and he feels him, and he feels like he's rough and hairy like Esau really is. And he smells him, and it smells like Esau. So he's convinced. So he eats this stew, and then he pronounces the blessing. He gives this blessing to his son. And even though nothing is written out, it's like, almost like a legal contract. And, and the words of the blessing are, are really beautiful, and part of that blessing are recorded in the book of Genesis. Let me read that to you. And this is from Genesis 27, and this is Isaac giving this blessing to his son that he thinks is Esau. He says, "'May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness.'" an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers, and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. Now Jacob has it all. He's got the birthright. He's got the blessing. He is set for life. Quickly, he exits the tent just before Esau comes back. Esau comes into his dad. He's got the, the food he knows his dad likes. And so he brings it in and says, here, here I am. You know, eat, the, eat this and then give me the blessing. And Isaac says, who are you? And he says, oh, I'm your son Esau. And he says, well, who was that that was just in here that I blessed? And they realize that they've been deceived by Jacob. They've been tricked by him. And Esau is furious. He says, well, Father, give me a blessing also. And Isaac says, I, I can't. What is done has been done. The blessing has been given. And Esau is furious. He is enraged. And he yells out, Jacob, I'm going to kill you. And he vows that as soon as his father Isaac dies, he's going to kill his brother. Now, suddenly the situation for Jacob has changed a lot, hasn't it? For a while it seemed like he had everything. He had the birthright. He had the blessing. He's set for life. Now he's got a brother who's going to kill him. And he realizes if he's going to, if he's going to live, he needs to get out of there before his father dies. And so his mother sends him to Haran the town that, that Abraham had lived in where they still had relatives. She says, go there. You can stay with your family. Maybe even find a, find a, a wife there. So Jacob grabs a few things and heads out into the desert. And he runs as fast and as far as he can get from his brother who's looking to kill him. 
runs all day. It's nighttime now. He's exhausted. He's tired. He's hopeless. Everything that he valued in life, everything that he wanted, everything he thought he had was gone. His overly protective mother, the birthright, the blessing, his future, even his relationship with God was back there in the tents. He's alone. He's out in the desert. And he falls down on the ground and he leans back against a stone and he falls asleep and he has a dream, a vision. It's what often gets called you know, Jacob's ladder, although less of a ladder, more like a stairway or a set of stairs. And he has this vision and, and there in this vision there is this stairway that's leading from heaven all the way down to earth, right, right where he is. And there are angelic beings coming down from heaven to earth and going from earth back up to heaven. And there at the top of the stairway, he sees God. And God speaks to him. And this is what he says. Let me read it to you. This is from uh, Genesis 28. It says, There above it, above this stairway, stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob wakes up, and he realized the awesome thing that has happened. Just when he thought he'd left God, he was alone, his future was uncertain, God reached out to him and blessed him. and said that the promises that God had made to his father, grandfather Abraham, his father Isaac, would now be the blessings to him. And Jacob is so moved by this. He, he says, it's, it's like right here in the desert. I didn't even know it. Like this is the house of God. And he takes that, that stone that he'd been leaning against and he sets it up on end and he, he pours some oil on it to like anoint it like it's a, like a holy altar. And he says, this is, this is like the house of God. And he says, I'll call it Bethel. Beth meaning house, El meaning God. This is, this is the house of God. And I'm going to remember that this was right here that I met God and he reached out to me. And he sets out on his way then a changed man. It seems to me like this story is not untypical of what we see happening again and again in the Bible. That people encounter God, they meet God, and it changes them. It's not too different than Moses, right? So Moses has also run out into the desert because in Egypt he's killed an Egyptian. He's fleeing for his life. And at one point as he's shepherding some sheep, he sees a bush that's burning. Remember? And he starts to go toward the bush because it isn't being consumed. He wants to see what's going on. And a voice speaks to him out of the bush. And it's the voice of God. And God says, Moses, take the shoes off your feet because the land on which you are standing is holy ground. What made it holy? I mean, it was just a patch of ground in the desert. What made it holy was the same thing that made Bethel holy for Jacob. It was the presence of a holy God. And it seems to me that two things really occur when people encounter God. First, they're aware of the holiness of God, that God is holy and righteous and glorious. And they are aware that they are not, that they are sinful people who don't deserve God's love or forgiveness. It happened to Isaiah, prophet in the Old Testament. I, I know I'd read this story many times, but I remember reading it one time and being so moved by this encounter that Isaiah has with God that I memorized it. It says in Isaiah 6, you know, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The, the train of his robe indicating how important he is. The train filled the temple, and the whole house was filled with smoke, the incense, the prayers of God's people going up to this holy God. 
And above him stood the seraphim, each having six wings. The seraphim were these angelic spiritual beings. And it says they had six wings, and with two they covered their faces. Why? Because they dare not look upon this holy God. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And Isaiah says, what's his response? He says, well, what's me? I'm going to die. Because my eyes have beheld the king, the Lord of glory. And it says, then one of, one of the seraphim went to the, the altar and took one of the burning coals. And he brought it to him. And he touched his lips with it. And he said, now your sins are forgiven and your iniquities are pardoned. Isaiah encountered God, and he saw God in his holiness, and he saw himself in his sinfulness and his unworthiness. Something almost like that happened to Peter, Jesus' disciple in the New Testament. It's a kind of a story that's overlooked a lot, but man, it's so profound. Jesus has actually gotten into one of the boats along the Sea of Galilee because there were so many people on the shore wanting to listen to Jesus that he's kind of get crowded into the boat that belongs to Peter and his brother Andrew. And so he's teaching them from the boat, and then he's done. He sends the people away, and he says, well, now let's go out and let's do some fishing. Oh, swell. I mean, Peter and Andrew have been fishing all night, and they've caught nothing, and now this joker who doesn't know anything about fishing is going to teach us you know, how to fish. All right, so they take the boat out in the deeper water, and Jesus says, oh, throw the nets there. And they cast their nets, and they start to pull them in. You remember that amazing story? And there are so many fish in the nets, the nets start to break, and they're sort of shoveling the, the fish into the boat, and there are so many fish, the boat is starting to sink, and they call over their, their business partners, you know, to come and bring their boat as well, because it's, you know, it's, it's like they've never seen this many fish in their lives. And all of a sudden, Peter looks at Jesus sitting there in the boat smiling at him. And he gets this glimpse, this true glimpse. This is, this is not an ordinary man. And the Bible says he got down on his knees in the boat in the midst of all the flopping fish. And he says to Jesus, depart from me. Because I'm a sinful man. When people encounter a holy God, they recognize their own sinfulness. But the glory is that it's God who reaches out to us in our lostness. It's God who, despite his holiness and despite our sin, has provided a way that we could come into his presence. The whole structure of the temple in Jerusalem was built not to bring people close to God, but to keep people away from a holy God. Remember, the temple itself was just this fairly small building, but around it, these big courtyards with walls, and the outside wall had a sign on it that said, you know, if you're not Jewish, you better not grow in here, you know, or you may forfeit your life. Gentiles or people with deformities couldn't come close to God. And the next area you could go into was for the Jewish women, and they not, could not go any farther. And the next area, Jewish men could go, but they couldn't go into the courtyard surrounding the temple either. Only the priests were there. And the priests couldn't go into the temple. We, could, we picture the temple like, like a church, you know, with people coming and going. Nobody went into the temple. Remember when, when, when John the Baptist was born and his father was a priest, and it was his turn by lots that had been drawn, that he could go into the temple to burn incense, that was probably the only time in his life, although he was a priest, the only time in his life when he could go into the temple, to this part of the temple, to offer incense to God on behalf of the people. You didn't go in there. That's where God was. And at the back, the far end of the, of the temple was that curtained off area, the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and who went in there? The high priest, once a year. And first he had to, to bathe and to put on clean clothing and to offer sacrifices for the sins of his family and for himself. And then, only then, once a year, he could go into the presence, through the curtain, into the presence of God. And people thought he might die in there. To see the face of God, he might die. 
And they tied a cord around his ankle so if he died while he's in the Holy of Holies, they couldn't go in to get him because nobody else could go in. They'd be able to pull him out. It's a really interesting story in, in Moses' life where Moses is at Mount Sinai and he says to God, you know, can I see you? And, and God says to him, in effect, yes and no. He says, that there's a cleft in the, on the mountain, you know, an indentation. He said, I'll put you there and I'll cover you with my hand. He said, and then my glory will pass by. And you'll be able to see that. But he said, you can't see my face because to see my face is to die God is a holy God, and people are sinful people, and you can't come into the presence of God in your sin. How is that going to happen? How can we encounter God and be changed and be transformed? It's through Jesus Christ. And Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Do you remember what happened then at that moment that Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross? That curtain in the temple that separated the, the presence of God from people was torn from top to bottom. The way into the presence of God was now open to sinful people like us through the blood of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. When we encounter a holy God it changes us. I had an experience like that once. I hesitate to tell the story uh, in part because it makes me sound really weird. And, and I, don't, uh, I don't, but l let me tell you, because it was my encounter with God that, that changed me. I, I went to a church-related college and had to take the introductory to religion class, and the intention of the in instructor, I know, was to destroy our faith, to tear down everything we believed. And he wrote the textbook, and it said the same thing. The Bible is not true. It's lies and myths and misconceptions, and everything you've been taught about God is probably false and wrong. And it crushed me. I had grown up believing in God, believing in Jesus, believing the Bible. It was, it was so core to my life, to who I was. And I remember going home. I, I'm not sure if it was over spring break or, or in summer vacation. And I got home, and I was, I, was, I was desperate. Everything I believed about God was just gone. I was, how could I have been so wrong, so stupid? And I remember I cried out to God. I said, God, I don't even know if you exist. I don't even know if you're real anymore. But God, if you exist, if you care about me, show yourself to me. And a strange thing began to happen. There in that dark bedroom that night, there was a light. And I could tell that the light was forming itself into Jesus I, I can't explain it any better other than to say, you know on Star Trek where Scotty would beam somebody up, you know, and suddenly they, you know, and then it'd become the person? It, it sort of looked like that. There was this light in my room, and I knew it was Jesus hearing my desperate cry and reaching out to me. And I turned away, and I felt so ashamed of my doubt, and I said, I'm sorry, forgive me. I had no right to ask this of you. And it changed my life. It changed my life. It destroyed my doubts. It built my faith again. I am totally convinced that God wants to, to reach out to us, even at those times when we don't expect it, at those times when we don't deserve it because he loves us so much and he's proved that through Jesus Christ. And let me just mention three principles in clothing and closing, and I'll make these really quick. And the first is this. No matter how far you may feel from God, you know, he is always close. You can't judge God on the basis of your feelings or emotions. You may feel like Jacob out in the desert where everything is gone, everything is destroyed, and God is nowhere in sight. I want you to know that God is close to you there. You remember what the angel said to Joseph when he was announcing that Jesus was going to be born? He said, his name will be called 
Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is God with us. Secondly, God takes the initiative in reaching out to us. He doesn't wait until we reach out to him. He's always reaching out to us. It's the story that Jesus told of the prodigal son who lives this debauched life of of sin and in desperation then after everything is lost, he's heading back toward his father and his father is standing there at the end of the road. And what does his father do when he sees his son coming? No. It says he runs down the road to his son and he embraces him. God races down the road to us and embraces us. And finally, I want you to know that there is nothing in your life that will ever separate you from the love of God. Let's pray. Thank you, holy God, for doing the impossible for us, for reaching out to us in our sin and lostness, paying the price of our sin on the cross so that we can know that you are always near and we can always come back to you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing these last couple songs out together.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down
was fear, you brought courage. When I was afraid, you were with me. And you lifted me up. And you lifted me up. Yeah, sing that truth out. Where there was death. Where there was death, you brought life. No matter how far you may feel you are from God, God is right here with us. He is for you. He is with you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Look for God reaching out to you in the most unexpected ways because he wants to transform each and every one of our lives. So let's fix our eyes on the one who wants to change us for his glory. Guys, thank you so much for joining us in the room and also those of you online. If you're looking for a way to take a next step, come talk to me or hospitality team, scan that QR code. Um, I'll be hanging out out in the atrium. I know Pastor Ed will be right up here next to the stage. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week when Dave Bartlett will be in the house wrapping up this transformation series. Have a good one.